Yeah. Yeah, Emma. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think we'll I think we'll stop that. Sorry, but we've got to do a TV show now. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was great. Just that, really. Sit. Hello and welcome to Free Speech. The show which makes your voice heard in the national conversation. <laughs> Hello, I'm Rick Edwards, this is my friend Tina. Hi, I'm Tina Dehealy. And this is an audience of Welsh people. <laughs> We've had months of Scotland and then a load about England and we thought, let's head to Wales because we believe in equality. Yes, we do. And equally as important as the audience here is you guys at home. For the next hour, you can get involved in our live debate. Send me your comments as well as your questions. If you disagree or agree with any of the points being made here today, let me know. You can tweet us at BBC Free Speech or Facebook your comments. Here are the addresses you'll need. Uh, even if we don't read your comments out, other people watching and tweeting will see them and you can have a whole debate online which is just as good, if not better. Lots are coming up today, not least the film and the question, do we live in a sexist country, which we released a week ago on social media. That's coming up. Uh, before we do anything, I want to introduce our wonderful panel. They are the founder of the Everyday Sexism Project, Laura Bates, compassionate conservative and comedian Omar Hamdi, freelance journalist Angela Epstein, and the leader of Plaid Cymru, Liam Wood. And that is your panel. <laughs> our first question this evening comes from our leaderboard. Tina, what you got for me? Yes, it does. All week, free speech viewers have been going to the Choose Our Questions page on Facebook. Now, if you go to freespeechquestions.co.uk, it will direct you to the right place. When you're there, you'll see all the questions that have been submitted since the end of the last show. Now, this is how it works. People click like on the questions they want to see on the show. We count up those likes to make this the leaderboard. It should appear here, hopefully very, very soon. Don't leave me hanging. This week, the question at the top of the leaderboard was this. Here we go, from Kaylee Sales. How is it right to have a lower minimum wage for young adults aged 18 to 21? Do we not do the same jobs and work the same hours? That's from Kaylee. OK, so our question is, should the minimum wage have age bans then? Uh, start with you, Leanne. I think in principle that there should be a going rate for the job and so there shouldn't be a differentiation on the grounds uh, of age. And I also think that an important principle should be that if you work full time, if you work a 40 hour week, that your income should be enough to live on. So a living wage? A living wage, yes. And at, at present we've got too many people who are living below the living wage, which means that they work full time and they struggle to make ends meet and often are reliant upon additional state benefits to top up their wage. So my party, Plaid Cymru, believes in a, a living wage. Mm -hmm. We believe that 260,000 people in Wales could be uh, given a pay rise if a living wage was introduced uh, tomorrow and uh, that if that were to happen, that it would save on the benefit bill and it would also ensure that people who went out to work full time brought home enough money okay. to, to live on. Is that, uh, 
Is that a realistic model, do you think, Angela? I think it's a fair point. Look, we've got to break the cycle of welfare dependency. We have to make it profitable for young people to go to work and not make it incentivize them by saying that it's cheaper to stay in bed. People want to work. There is a dignity in going to work. And, and obviously, it's the, other, the other problem about having um, an inequality in the pay band is it knuckles any other argument. It sets a very dangerous precedent. Because how can you say on the, in one breath, well, actually, young people um, should be paid slightly less for the same job? And then that knuckles all the arguments about men and women or able-bodied and disabled people. The fact is, if you do a job, I'd like to think if I did my job as well as you or you did your job as well as the next person, that the job was done, then you should be paid for the job of work, not for who they are. If somebody is less experienced, they don't do as much work, they, they don't do the same amount of hours, okay. But we cannot have an argument about equality in any area of employment if we start with this, because as I say, the precedent will be set and we can use that as almost like case law for anything else. Uh -huh. uh, gentlemen here. The panel have said today about bringing down the benefit bill, and that sort of concerns me a bit because... Um, obviously, there are people who are genuinely dependent on, on benefits. Obviously, mm. as you said, that you know there are some people who sort of, you know, um, do there's, there's... abuse the system. Um, but I know a lot of people who've left university, for example, genuinely can't find jobs, things like that. And it concerns me that this isn't just an issue um, in terms of um, pay, employee pay. This also an issue in terms of benefits. Mm. If you're 18, I think it's about 50 pounds per week you get on job seekers allowance. It's not. A lot it's not a great deal I know people who are genuinely financially struggling because you know and if they were over 23 24 25 they would actually be entitled so to 70 quid a week so age you know. inequality in, in the benefits can I just make well. this point about yes, the benefits yeah. though because it's so easy for politicians to attack people who claim benefits and I am not one of those politicians I can assure you of that <laughs> sense to pay people uh, benefits because they're not earning enough in work. That money should be paid to them as a wage and people who are working full time should have no need of additional top of benefits. But the people who rely on state benefits shouldn't be bashed in the way that politicians are all too happy to bash them. Uh, yeah, gentlemen here. Uh, because Plaid Cymru is obviously part of the Coalition in Wales. What are our AMs actually trying to do then to solve this problem? Because well, so far I've seen nothing and I've been in many minimum wage jobs and yeah. we're good. voting for people in Parliament good, and as Good AMs. question, Leanne. Well, the first point is that Plaid Cymru isn't co in coalition uh, at the moment. We were up until 2011, but it's a Labour government in Wales now. And the second point is that our National Assembly for Wales doesn't have the power to set the rate for the minimum wage. My party, Plaid Cymru, wants to see the Assembly having powers over that and a, a range of other uh, workers' rights issues. But at the moment, we don't have that power. OK. Uh, yeah, lady in the orange here at the front. Um, the majority of people who are claiming benefits at the moment are actually people who are pension age. Mm. Um, and these people have already paid into the system and therefore are drawing out. Why have we still got uh, politicians, though, who are still drawing a state pension when they've had, you know, really good salaries throughout, the, throughout their lives? Why are we not giving that up from politicians and they're sacrificing that? And I guess it's got to be fair to say that politicians aren't the highest earning people in, uh, in the country. So you would apply that equally to other high earners. Uh, Omar, what do you think about that? I, well, I just think the whole... If I can go back to the original question about young people being paid less, I think it's... Let's call it what it is. It's age discrimination. That's, that's what I think it is. It's, 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 it's amazing that, like, the, the debate has lasted. Like, I know we're only getting started, right, but we've had a few minutes and no-one has said, oh, my God, what a monstrosity. How can the young people be paid less? If it was... How would we feel if it was anyone between the age of 60 and 63 was being paid less or between 40 and 43 or something? We'd go, oh, my God, that's mental. And I don't think young people particularly are of no value. I don't think Mark Zuckerberg started Facebook because he's worth 20% less... His labour's worth 20% less than older people. So I think it's quite insulting, I think. And if we are going to have a minimum wage, I don't think young people particularly need to be told that they're not worthless. I think we all know that young people do a lot, right? Uh, but I think if we are going to have a minimum wage, it has to be one size fits all. It has to be fair. OK. Uh, yeah, gentlemen here with the hair. Going back to the question of politicians giving up their state pension, um, why should politicians who work equally as hard as any other person in society have to give up the pension that they earn through the work of their life? Go on. 
and for a second point they get huge expense allowances and various other allowances that most normal people don't get. <laughs> yeah, go on. Quite enjoying say, this for now. I always have to say they're not worthy of their state pension, which how how come other people are more worthy of their state because pension we... than politicians who work do work equally we as hard. We pay the politicians, so our tax is already going to pay the politicians. Why should we therefore then pay them a state benefit as it well? Is, it is nice to think that Tony Blair is walking into a Swiss bank drawing a pension, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I want to talk a bit about the cost uh, to small businesses and businesses in general, though, if you did um, get rid of age bans. Uh, any, anyone got any thoughts on that? Yes, sir. Yeah, well, I was going to say, firstly, we were talking about young people, so I don't really think we should be discussing politicians. The next point is that People are looking for younger workers because they have to pay them less, which is keeping their profits higher. And I think the politicians are missing the trick where if they took away that and young people were able to earn the same, they've got less responsibilities in general, they're able to spend more, they've got more free money, which will end up coming back into the tax bracket, you know, and into the, the government to actually, you know, use more um, for the NHS or to do other things. So young people shouldn't be treated any different. I agree, if they're doing the job, they need to be paid the same as an adult. You were class doing it. OK. Uh, yeah, lady here. Um, yeah, you said that, you know, it could be damaging to small businesses who, who can pay younger people I less. I asked the question. Well, yeah. But um, <laughs> the thing is, you can be incentivising businesses to take on uh, young people in other ways, um, particularly paid apprenticeship schemes. That's a massive thing that needs to be improved in Wales at the moment. At the moment, apprentices are paid next to nothing to do quite a lot of work, and they don't get any support in the same way that students do at college or university. Um, so, again, there's a massive issue with businesses and young people and how they're employed. But the suggestion that they can suffer, well, that needs to be something that's addressed by both government and politicians. OK. Uh, yeah, lady in the green. In order to have the different age differences, is the under 18s, it's to encourage them not to go to work and to stay in school. But once you're over 18, it's your decision to go to do full time work. You might not want to do higher education, you might want to go get your 40 hour job, earn a living wage. But what's the difference between an 18 year old and a 21 year old? I understand that a 16 year old has many different needs to an 18 year old, but once you're 18, you are an adult. You can do what you want and you should earn your wage. Okay. Um Laura, youth unemployment is, is nearly three times higher than uh, overall unemployment. Um, so is it not reasonable then to have an incentive for employers to take on young people by having them paid less? I think it's right that we should have incentives for employers to take on young people, given that statistic, but I don't see why that incentive should be at the cost of young people themselves. Surely there are other ways to incentivise taking on young people. Like if you what? look at the gap between 18-year-olds and 21-year-olds, it seems to me that this is specifically penalising young people who don't go to university, which seems really unfair. And I also think it's really important that we don't generalise. I mean, we did say that some young people have a greater kind of disposable income. Somebody says, you know, they're more likely to be able to go and spend. But we've got to think also about the fact that there are young parents, you know, and that this could be really penalising, especially young parents, young single mothers who are trying to support themselves, maybe trying to support children as well. And to be penalised just for their age seems completely unfair to me. Yeah. <laughs> Angela, how do you, how would you incentivise businesses to take on young people if you pay everyone the same? Well, I think I think what um, the young lady up there said was absolutely right about this issue about. Um, apprenticeships. I think you need to look at your, your professional life as a kind of trajectory. You don't want it to flatline. You want to think, well, OK, I'm doing here and it's a bit rubbish and the pay's not great, but I don't always want, I don't want to look back in three years' time and still be here. I want to be going that way. I want to, so young people, yes, not everybody wants to go to university. Not everybody is, is capable academically. So they need a trade. They need a label. They need to find a, a purpose in life for which they will be amply rewarded. And the, the, the issue that we have with this age discrimination, which is, you know, really hits the nail on the head, is We've not used the word exploit. There is always, the, there are always the, the risk that we exploit young people because by definition that if they're being paid less, then somehow they are worth less. So even though they're doing technically the same job, they might get the grubby end of that particular job. And we need to see people as being on a, on a career path and on a, a journey so that they can, might be at the rubbish end of their CV, but one day they'll move on and, the, and they, they will feel right about doing that. And that's why apprenticeships or any kind of work structure which says, OK, do the rubbish now. I mean, we've probably all started doing a bit of photocopying and all the, all the kind of 
office dog's body stuff, but this is a means to getting on to the next stage. So structured progression Structure is, absolutely is what's required. Vital. Uh, Tina, what's happening online? Yeah, as you might have seen, that we've been running this question at the bottom of our screen. This, of course, is the power bar. Just use hashtag free speech yes or hashtag free speech no to give your view. We've had some answers already. I'll get to some of those, the online reaction. But as you can see, free speech yes. Is it right to have a low minimum wage for those aged 18 to 21? Only 17% of the online audience think yes. Um, interesting comments in contrast, though, have come in online already. Uh, this from Shauna. Most of the population at that age are still living with their parents, so don't need to bring in as much money, because they don't have to pay the bills or buy their own food, etc. Loads of hands are going. <laughs> <laughs> Just like a forest of hands immediately. <laughs> Shauna goes on to say, when I was 17, 18, I was working for £3.40 an hour, and I survived fine. I don't know when she was working for that much. Okay, uh, but, but anyway, hang on. And another one from Ross as well. We need a lower minimum wage all around, six pounds an hour. How would you respond to that? Those sorts of comments coming in. Yeah. Well, I think the point about exploitation is a good one as well. And one of the strongest arguments I can think about having uh, against having different rates is that if you are an exploitative employer, then the easiest thing to do is to take on a young person because they're cheap. And as soon as they reach the age where the rate would go up you sack them and you take on another person who is cheap. And uh, I think that is something that uh, we should be opposed to. So. What about businesses, though, who say they can't create jobs if the, if the wage goes up? Well, I remember this debate um, back in the mid-90s uh, when the minimum wage was first introduced. And I remember then that many businesses, uh, and including uh, the CBI at the time, said... Business will, will be put out of, out of business. They won't be able to afford to do this. And as far as I'm aware, that didn't actually happen. So I, I, I can understand their concerns, but I think that previous experiences would tell us that that, that didn't materialise necessarily. Okay. A couple more quick comments. Uh, your hand shot up. Um, when she was... The girl on the phone, I'm assuming it's Shauna. on like Twitter, Shauna, um, was saying, like, well, I lived at home and I survived on £3.20 or whatever it was. 40. <laughs> £3.40. Yeah, massive. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm 19 and living at home and I have a job that doesn't pay much. But if I was where, but I'm supposed to be saving up for university and to go visit family and various other things that I would really like to be able to pay for, and especially university, because I don't particularly want to be taking out... 9,000 plus pounds a year in loans, in student loans that I'll then have to pay back. And if I'm earning less than someone who's 21 or, what the, or the regular minimum wage, then it just makes me more dependent on those student loans at a later date mm -hmm. and, at, and at the, I guess, mercy of my family and my parents who I'm living with. Yeah, because you're if they, looking for the generosity of your family. Basically. Yeah. Uh, yeah, gentlemen here. Um, so, say we're talking about the, uh, the minimum wage uh, for 18 to 21 year olds. So, say if we were to raise this now, uh, would, do you reckon that should uh, affect the uh, tax boundary? Because uh, people, was it people under in, uh, in and under eight grand a year, they get the personal allowance, don't they? So, do you reckon we should lower the allowance as well if we are to increase the minimum wage? Hmm. Yeah. Well, you wouldn't be better off then, would you? you? You want to be better off, I would assume, from, from a measure that would equalise. So, um, you can you can you can do different things with tax allowances, but I don't think it should be related to the rate of minimum wage. Okay, uh, I think we're going to uh, move on now. Before our next question, though, sorry, <laughs> uh, a reminder that our next show in two weeks' time will be in Dover, uh, where we're going to be talking about immigration with Suzanne Evans, who's UKIP's deputy chairman, and journalist Owen Jones. Uh, two weeks after that, on Tuesday, the 21st of October, we're in London, and we're inviting anyone with a mental health issue to join us in the audience. Alistair Campbell will be a panellist. If you want to come to either of those shows, just put your name in an email to freespeechaudience at mentorn.tv. It's very quick, and the address should be at the bottom of the screen. Uh, but now, though, our next question starts with this film. Don't get your knickers in a twist. What do you say to a woman with two black eyes? Shouldn't listen the first time. Smile, love. It might never happen. How can you trust something that bleeds once a month and doesn't die? <laughs> it's just banter. 
Why are you always angry? You wouldn't dress like that if you didn't want people to look. Just a slap that won't shut up. Get your tits out. Get your tits out. Get your tits out. You look like a total freak. I bet you'd do anything. Let a man do it, love. Why don't you just sit there and look pretty? I'd absolutely ruin her. You'd be really pretty if you lost a bit of weight. She was asking for it. OK, so that's really resonated with our audience. We had 200,000 views this week uh, for that. Uh, do we live in a sexist country? Laura? Yes. OK, that's <laughs> enough. Uh, our next question is going to be... I mean, uh, elaborate. Obviously, you know, I'm being flippant, but it, it, the evidence is overwhelming. It doesn't matter whether you look at anecdotal evidence, whether you look at the number of people who came forward there within, you know, a day or two just for that filming, the anecdotal evidence that floods into my website, the Everyday Sexism Project, we've got over 80,000 people's experiences, or whether you look at figures like the fact that 30,000 women a year lose their job because of maternity discrimination, that one in three 16 to 18 year old girls experiences unwanted sexual touching at school, that a poll just this week showed that 47% of female university students experiences groping, sexual assault under UK law, that two women a week are killed in the UK by a current or former partner, 85,000 women raped every year. I could go on and on and on. I don't know how you could argue otherwise. Okay. Uh, here. It's the um, statement you made a moment ago about two, two women a week being, being killed by a partner or a former partner. I know you have said that in the past, back in December at a TEDx talk you held. Uh, that has been proven, has been found to be false according to government statistics. And um, Mike Buchanan of the political party Justice for Men and Boys has made a public challenge for you to rescind that statement and contacted you directly and since then you have said nothing. But obviously don't Why do that? that. How would you respond to that, Laura? Um, I'd advise anybody to Google Mike Buchanan and have a look at the very many and very detailed rebuttals that have been made of his work. He spent his time writing blog posts where he makes fun of people who talk about feminism but doesn't make any kind of logical points against. I think it's really very damaging, though, on a national platform like this to try and suggest that a national figure, a very widely accepted and respected figure, like the figure that over two women per week are killed by a current or former partner, is incorrect. I think it's very dangerous to go around suggesting that statistics like that aren't true. That is absolutely the official figure. What, what confuses me about this question is that we've taken the term sexism and we're lumping a lot of things in together into one big steaming pot. Now, any conscientious, um, civil-minded member of society should absolutely balk at sexual objectification of women, domestic violence, insulting, vile behaviour. Absolutely. It doesn't matter if a man says it, if a woman says it. Collectively, as a society, we should absolutely object to that. But the problem is that when we're talking about... The question that you asked was, is this a sexist society? This is nothing... We're not talking about, is this a, a society that, that propagates domestic violence? We have to decide where the lines of demarcation lie. Now, for us to suggest that we're a sexist society suggests that there is absolutely no scope for women to make great inroads into all areas of professional life. And to, just to throw a few statistics back, and bearing in mind, as the young man said, and as Laura answered back, you can make stats work any which way you want, if you want to. Politicians would tell you that better than me. Yeah. But, sorry, cheap gag. But... <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you're really sorry, either. <laughs> but, um, but, but, the, but the point is that women regularly out... Boys... Sorry, girls regularly outperform... Um, women regularly outperform boys at school. Um, there are more women going to university now than men. My own son making... Pers anecdotalising it. Um, he's just started a course at university. There are 70% of the course is women. It's a medical course. 70% are girls. They all needed really high grades to so get on that course. So why are running all the companies, then? So maybe... Why, why I'll tell you exactly on? why. Yeah. I'll tell you why. No. So let me tell you exactly why. There are two very good answers to that. Either because they don't want to, 
or because they can't, right? Now, there are two very good reasons. Okay, no, I'm not condescending, and that's the problem. <coughs> the problem with the sexism debate is it, de it, it degenerates into something very personal very quickly, with a bit of name-calling there. It's not helpful. The fact is that, like it or not, Biology makes us different. It doesn't make us better and it doesn't make us worse. It makes us different. I'm sorry, Laura, but once you have children, you may not want to have <laughs> <laughs> Okay. 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 I didn't mean you personally. Once you have once you once, have once kids, you'll grow up, you'll right. agree with us. Sorry. Once on. a woman has children, she may find that all the greatest <laughs> plans that she had for pursuing her career may be she'll be challenged biologically by the way she feels. Now you cannot legislate what you <laughs> feel once you have kids. And the second thing is very okay. quickly is that we live in a meritocracy. And I don't know about you in the audience, particularly the women in the audience. I don't want to get a job because I'm fulfilling somebody's female quota or women's shortlist. I want to be the best person for that job. Okay. Uh, so that's Angela experience. Uh, yes, lady here. Um, I'd just like to say, Laura, I completely 100% agree with you. As I've grown up, I'm 16 at the moment, I've noticed that more and more I'm witnessing more sexism. There's an area in my street that I actually avoid because I get wolf whistled, which is ridiculous. Also, I'm an aspiring filmmaker, and earlier this year I attended a film networking class aimed at 16 to 18 year olds and in that class there are two um, male directors who are very successful and I asked both of them what can I do to achieve the absolute best I can in this industry and they both said to me you've got to make relationships with other people and by that love I don't mean sleeping around I was with two other boys my age neither of them received that the same advice they were like oh yes talk to these people look at these people sign up for this apprenticeship he was basically <clears> assuming because I was a female my first sort of, the first thing I do in a professional situation was to go and sleep with someone to promote myself. I haven't even entered the world of work yet and that's given me an insight into thinking actually what is in between my legs is going to determine how well I'm going to do in an industry. And it's absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. So, uh, yeah. what's, what's your experience been as a female, as a female politician, Leanne? How have, you, how have you found it? I mean, famously, there are not as many women in, in politics as perhaps there should be if you look at the sort of nationwide statistics. No, it's a man's world. There's no doubt about that. Um, even though in our National Assembly in Wales there are many more women and there are many more women in the Cabinet and uh, we were at one point a gender-balanced institution, which is something uh, which I'm very proud of. But nonetheless, there is uh, definite sexism within the world of politics. And if you look at the House of Commons, well, you only need to look at the benches to see the gender imbalance uh, there. And I think um, I just wanted to come, uh, come back on one of the points that was made um, here about girls outperforming boys in school, girls outperforming boys in university. But then what we don't see is women heading organisations, becoming the chief executive. And whichever uh, sector that you look at, it's men that dominate uh, at the top on the boards and all the rest of it. And um, I'm afraid until that situation is reversed, then we have to conclude, and I agree with what Laura said, we have to conclude that we live in not just a sexist society, but we also live in a racist society, a homophobic, transphobic society, an ageist society. There is a lot of discrimination out there that we should actually not be prepared to put up with. So, so you say, um, until, we, until we reverse... Sorry. Until we reverse that, but how do we go about reversing that? Because Angela just said she doesn't want to get a job because of a quota. Well, I think um, Angela said uh, there are two reasons why women don't get to the top. One is that they, they don't want to, and, and another is that they can't. And I would say that there are lots of institutional barriers stopping women. There are glass ceilings in organisations preventing women uh, from reaching the top. And so you don't children, think it's a meritocracy? Uh, no, I definitely don't think it is. And having children does have something to do with it because who provides the majority of the childcare in society. And I, I don't, in my own family, my partner provides the childcare, or otherwise I wouldn't be able to do the job that I do. But in, uh, in the average family, in the average community, it is women who take that job, not just looking after the children, but looking after elderly relatives as well. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, sorry for this gentleman here. Wait for there, please. It's there. Yep. Um, 
One idea that seems to be purported a lot is in terms of sexism. Yes, we do live in a sexist country, but one thing the video didn't help with is the fact that people tend to believe that sexism works one way. So the video only featured women. <laughs> Turns around and says, "Okay, what about ideas like the disposable male, male genital mutilation, which everybody is totally fine with? You know, you get circumcised. Um, man, through the idea to man up if you're not strong, if you aren't doing things, men are expected to do the heavy lifting. Absolutely. I would accept it works that. both I ways, and that video, you know, for one, didn't help any quite a lot of responses." Is it that, that's such an important point. It's, this isn't about a gender war. Look at this panel. Isn't it amazing? We've got an anti-feminist woman and a feminist man. This is <laughs> like how mental is that? <laughs> Would you have such a random panel as this? <laughs> Not non feminist, sorry. Um, but so this isn't about gender wars. And of course, and do you know what? Men, men are the victims of patriarchy, men are the victims of sexism, even though, let's not be silly, the majority of the time it's women who are on the receiving end. It's but, probably a but, good time to hear from some men who've got in touch from home. Jack. Uh -huh. This kind of proves, you're talking about the film we showed before where people are giving examples of everyday sexism. This proves women are always moaning, ha ha, exclamation mark. Jokes aside, some of these were offensive, but I feel like a lot of this is banter being misunderstood. I guess women have no sense of humour. And another one, uh, Eddie, who says, one I get all the time, what do you expect? He's just a man. Omar, your response to that one. I, I think it's just crazy that that's even, like, it's, it's even uncomfortable listening to it, isn't it? I mean, the, fa the fact that within seconds of Laura introducing the debate, within seconds, I'm like, respect to you for bringing up statistics and I'm not having a go or anything. Like, well done for even coming to this show. I wouldn't do this when I was 18. I was in my bedroom, yeah? But I was, yeah, so well done. But the fact that within a second, the debate descended into, well, actually, if you look at the statistics, there's this. That would never happen with anything else. Leanne was talking about different types of discrimination. If we said, is there racism in the UK? You'd never have a room of people going, well, well, actually, I think there was black people just like to moan. We'd even... <laughs> we'd never do that! We'd never do that! But there's something, there's something about our culture, there's something about our culture that has made sexism just a bit of banter, you know? No, if someone had okay. tweeted in, if someone had tweeted in saying, oh, these blacks just like to moan, straight away, someone would be thinking, right, I think that's a criminal offence. With women, oh, yeah. well, oh, it probably is, it was just a lad, it's just a lad. Okay. <laughs> Enthusiasm, but try not to wallop me. Um, <laughs> I know it's unintentional. Um, it, can I just sort of nose this into the fact that you said is society sexist? If we look at just just the account of you in terms of the way it's an, it seems to be a, a one-way journey, there are whole advertising campaigns which are built upon a culture of women ogling men. A certain fizzy drink, women stop. <laughs> they stop at their. They stop. I'm sorry, I didn't do the advert. They stop at their lunch break because the window cleaner's going to take his shirt off and open this can of fizzy drink. Women on their hen nights queue up to go and see acts like the Chippendales. They're allowed to catcall, they're allowed to throw things at them. Can you imagine if the, the, the same thing happened the other way around? Yeah, or if they're... It or other, yes. <laughs> Have you seen Have you seen no, I'm talking about an advertising campaign, an advertising campaign where a woman <laughs> stopped to have her can of fizzy drink and revealed herself in a wet T-shirt. Well, everybody the in the advert. office looked at the flake advert. The flake advert was was supposed to be something sort of terribly beautiful and, <laughs> and romantic. <laughs> you know, it wasn't about women. Also, no one from Cadbury's is here to defend themselves. So, uh, Laura. Angela, I would try and give you back the list of examples in which women are objectified and sexualized and dehumanized, but we'd be here all night and we don't have time. <laughs> comments online though is that this is about an attitude problem as well this is about the way that society treats women this is about the way that we even have these discussions and talk about these things it's about that tendency to dismiss these these ideas we're talking about issues as diverse as sexual harassment to domestic violence to rape and people are saying don't you have a sense of humor you know I mean it's just ridiculous to suggest that women are only four of the top 100 directors of top 100 companies in the UK because they either don't want to or they're not good enough isn't that really the problem, girls, that you just can't be bothered or you don't have See, the I, talent. I object but we know, to this but we kind know of Hang on, Omar. I object to this kind of, come on, girls, we're all... This stoking up of kind of, you know, we're all militant women together. I think you actually... You actually strike a huge own goal. It's entirely counterproductive to kind of rank it up into some kind of militant response. I never for a second suggested that, you know, sexual objectification, domestic violence were not issues that, that had to be taken seriously. That was the very preface of but my comments. Say, Angela, but feminism, modern 
Laura. Uh, finish, Laura. Modern day feminism seems to edit as it listens, and that way it becomes entirely counterproductive. <laughs> there are genuine things, genuine sexist things in society that, as society as a whole, we have to fight against. But you cannot put issues of domestic violence, which is the enormous problem, alongside whether a woman should feel t totally objectified if somebody <coughs> calls her love or petal or is wolf whistled at. It depends whether she feels threatened, and we have to, as a society, define very carefully the difference between, yes, not having a sense of humour, but actually feeling threatened threatened and when there are very serious issues of personal safety but at Angela, risk and that's what feminism does not do. These issues sure. are on a spectrum and actually feminism tackles them as a spectrum. If we see women as second class citizens, if we teach young girls in the street to grow up and think it's okay for men to shout at them, to shout about their breasts, if we show a naked woman on page three of our biggest selling national newspaper, of course that's I'm suggesting that there are connections. I'm not suggesting that somebody goes out and sees page three and commits an assault. Of course I'm not. Of course it's not that simple. But we have to look at the context in which we're seeing an epidemic of sexual violence, of violence against women. And we have to look at the attitudes that are at the base of these things. We have to look at the fact that we live in a society that sends incredibly intense messages about women and their role in society from a very young age. And the fact that those kinds of ideas and attitudes about women are also at the root of some of the bigger problems. I think it's the Can I use an example? Yeah, just have a quick uh, just, just check on online. related to what you were saying, this is from Abby, and if we're talking about banter, my 16-year-old hears the word rape used by boys at school on a regular basis, but of course it's just dismissed as banter. Mm. I don't, yeah, absolutely, that's absolutely disgusting. Is that part of the same culture? No, I think we have to be very, very, yes, we have to be clear about what's being used as banter. There is a big difference between somebody rather patronisingly call, calling me petal and somebody, you, and a 16-year-old using rape as if it's some kind of easily dismissive term. So what if, it was the racist, what if it was the racist equivalent of petal, which is another P word? Would you also no, say that that's nothing? No, that's entirely different. Why is it entirely different? It's because discrimination. Because it's 50 percent of the country why? raging so war on the other 50 percent. Are you saying <laughs> Is it? things from the things that you don't see are more serious, then why shouldn't we also be able to fight things at every level of you the can, spectrum? You can, you why can shouldn't we be able to tackle sexism and sexual harassment in the street? You can, of course you should. There is no, there's a massive difference between tackling sexual harassment in the street and looking at things that are almost trivial and trivialise the big things that you need to fight for and that we all need to fight for in order to make sure there is equality between men and women. So, for example, very quickly, the campaign, um, I think it was last year or the earlier this year, about having more women on banknotes. What a spectacular waste of time and energy. Make sure women have the, the, the exact no, number of banknotes in their pocket as men. Yes, that's a campaign I would absolutely endorse and support. But wasting the time, I think sometimes modern day feminism and sexism spoils for an argument to look for. OK, I want to come, come into our audience now. Thank you, Angela. Uh, yes, lady here. Um, I just want to go back to the point about banter. Banter I have with my colleagues, with my friends. I don't get banter from strangers on the street. And I mm. hate walking down the street and being yelled at, being caught, told to, uh, to smile, love, it might never happen. You don't know what my life is like. And I just think, like Laura said, this is symptomatic of a bigger picture. If we don't stop the street harassment, we won't stop anything else. OK. Uh, yeah, gentlemen here. I think, I think you only need to look back at history, look at the suffragette movement. Like, people lost their lives for the right for the women to vote. And I think it's really wrong that like some males trivialise calling someone like babe on the street. I think you need to look at the bigger picture. People died for equality, and mm -hmm. it should be equal. The country should be yeah, equal. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> okay, but they, okay. So the question was originally obviously about how do we live in a sexist country, and we've identified in many ways in which you know women suffer from sexism, but there is nothing again. Uh, talking about the way the men still suffer for sexist opinions in the way that, for example, you know, there's, like, the fact that homeless people, oh, yeah, there is a priority for women. There are, um, and I'm not saying that, you know, in some cases, like, people who have children, for example, they definitely need, need that kind of support. But, like, there's, it, 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 your gender shouldn't make you vulnerable by me. Age, uh, and it's and it's your circumstance that makes you vulnerable. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, lady directly behind you. Uh, <laughs> um, firstly, with the militant side of feminism, 
if that doesn't work, then obviously the suffragettes went about it the wrong way. I went to school. Secondly, right, right, right. when we're about looking at feminism, what a lot of people seem to be missing is it's actually both sides of the same coin. Men get sexism because of fem of sexism towards women. Absolutely. Men get told to man up because Absolutely. feminism is sh shown as something bad. Women do good in school because now school has become feminized. Girls are expected to be scholarly. They're expected to do well. As a result, a lot of boys don't put as much effort into it as they see it as something that they shouldn't be doing. So, it's the same I, coin. I, it's just flip okay. sides of it. Yeah. So, is that something that you think about as well, Laura? I mean, sexism is something that has a negative impact on everybody. Um, we get stories that come into the Everyday Sexism Project. We had one the other day that came from a man who asked for paternity leave from work and had been ridiculed in the office for asking for it and denied it. And in the same week, we got a story from a woman who'd been denied a promotion because she was considered a maternity risk. And just as the lady in the audience says, you know, that's two people not suffering different issues, but suffering two sides of the same coin. The same outdated gender stereotype makes things bad for men and women. This isn't about men against women it's not about vilifying no, it's men. not a gender war it's about it? people against it's, prejudice it's absolutely yeah. not a gender war. um <laughs> tina is the power bar up yeah, i look at the power bar to see what's happening at home if it works yes it does do we live in a sexist country that's the question that we've been asking during this debate 81 percent of people watching say yes some of the comments as well on men getting in touch um and one positive message to start with from Alex. This country has evolved fast. Far more women do dominate and inspire. More can be done, but let's appreciate the progress. Um, and this one is from Namibum. Uh, more girls are in uni than boys nowadays because if girls don't get a degree, they're more likely to be in low-paid work. So that's the reason why. Um, and then there was a question for Angela. How would you feel um, if somebody was doing the same job as you, a man, and got paid more than you? I'd be absolutely outraged. Of course I would. And it comes back to what I was saying right at the beginning of this discussion, which is that... And, in fact, Laura had somehow come full circle here because what's happened is that originally this sexism and fem feminism seemed to be kind of bywords for each other but really which is what i said at the beginning this is a collective responsibility for society if there are genuine um, injustice and inequalities in society as a society men and women we have to address them that's the key thing we cannot look at sexism as, as some kind of an, a, a brand of feminism or as a as something that's tailored entirely towards women just as i said I don't want female quotas, I don't want women shortlists, I want there to be a meritocracy. And that's why I would be absolutely appalled if somebody was paid more than me. But if we, if we kind of nose the whole debate about, about unfairness against women, it, first of all, it, it irritates because some people think, well, this is w women sort of, you know, they don't understand that there are men that, that have issues as well. And we have to work collectively. It's only by working in tandem that we will address in the, any of the inequalities in society. So do you, do you feel alienated by feminism as a movement? Yeah, I do, it doesn't speak to me at all. I went, the, the young man over there was, but, to mentioned the suffragettes. Um, my old girls' school, one of the alumni was a suffragette. I went to a girls' school and I was, it was a free place. I was a scholarship girl. There were no silver spoons. And I was taught, I had, came from a, a very modest background, I was taught, aim high, work hard, and if you can, you can get what you want. And that is the message that, it's the message I give my own daughter. It's not about, you know, feel vulnerable, feel threatened, don't think that a man can do what you can't do. It's about, you are a person, it's a meritocracy, prove that you can do the job and go ahead and do uh -huh. it. Uh, lady here, with purple hair. One of the major things is what you're missing is the reason why you've got part of this and the sexism on both sides. And it's a word I thought that was going to be used was lad c culture. Yeah. Lad culture doesn't even involve around us students. Lad culture is in the Eatons where they've got their little groups and they have that and they're told they've got to stick to this sort of world that they're supposed to be in. The reason why there are more male politicians, I think, in that top area it's not because the women aren't getting the education. It's because people at that level have the mindset that obviously, oh, you can't let somebody else do that because this okay. has always been a man's position. Yeah, yeah. that's an interesting point. Uh, yeah, gentlemen here. Hi, um, just want to say, Angela, um, the main problem I've got with what you said earlier was something to do with women's biology. Um, something women are somehow programmed to be a certain way, different to men. I just said we're different. It doesn't make us unequal. It just makes oh, yeah, biology, of course, biology makes I us understand. different. Um, all I would like to say is that that's not founded by academic research. Academic research shows that nature has a far larger impact. I'm not saying that nature doesn't have an impact on the way we are, but to the extent that you're making out, it's completely untrue. Okay. I'm, hang on, I'm sorry. 
I'm a primary school teacher, and yesterday I had a conversation with a six-year-old girl. And I said to her, um, what did you do on the weekend? And she went, I went to a football party, but the girls didn't play. That's not a natural thing to happen. Society has made people think that that's a natural thing to happen, but academic research shows it's not a natural process well, that we've come to. Well, okay. <laughs> Just, just on a straw poll level, I know lots and lots of women, professional women, um, you know, highly educated, been successful, who have, begun, who have thought differently once they've had their families. I've met tons and tons of women in all spheres of, of professional life. So that's one thing. Second thing about kids is kids, I must tell you, do what they want to do. I, I've got a daughter and three, three, who's got three older brothers, OK? Now, she, there are footballs, there are all the sort of paraphernalia of boys around the house. She, has, she is empowered by her choice to play with either her dolls or to have a kick around with her, her brothers in the back garden. Kids, particularly kids today who are so savvy and so sophisticated, they do what they want to do. And if girls don't want to play football, it's probably because they don't want to play football. OK, uh, we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, good debate. Our next question is from our studio audience, Simon Thomas. Where's Simon? Simon, what do you want to ask? Um, do you think that Wales should have the same powers as Scotland? OK. <laughs> Topical. Uh, Omar. <laughs> Should Wales have the same powers as Scotland? Yeah, absolutely. Of course Wales should have the same powers as Scotland. I think it's been long overdue that Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland, I know Northern Ireland's got its own situation, but it's been long overdue for Wales and Scotland to both forge their own identities. And I don't know why we've been holding back. I think we were, like me and Leanne were having a chat like just before we went on air. And I think Wales is just, uh, just Scotland with, with just a bit of an inferiority complex. And I think we should get rid of it. Yeah. I think we should get rid of it. Look around, look, look at this amazing building. Look at the music, look at the culture, look at the art, look at the history, look at the poetry, look at the comedy, <clears throat> yeah, everything. Yeah, <laughs> not just, it's, 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 you could just go on all day. Why, and, and I think it's about time we went for it. I think so are you in favor of independence? Yeah, I think absolutely. I think, I think Plaid Cymru's got quite a, quite a, a mature a, approach to it, as, as far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong, that we are working towards independence. And I think maybe one of the mistakes they made in Scotland is, is sort of getting ahead of themselves. But I think it's, and this works for England as well, by the way, just like Wales and Scotland have to stop viewing themselves as the subjugated sort of junior partner of England. It's about time England realised that, oh, you know what, we're not a colonial power anymore. We don't own the colonies anymore. Let's, let's, let's move on and rediscover ourselves. And you know what, if, if there's a better English identity, you won't have a vacuum for idiots like like the EDL or Britain First or whoever else is coming in. So we all need to be together. Uh, yeah, just, okay. <laughs> I just want to make the comment um, that, in honesty, uh, I'm very proud of being Welsh, etc. But we're not a country that's actually ready to be independent. We know <laughs> where our bread is being buttered, as you think. We know that we still rely on England for lawmaking powers, and substantially, we rely on England to provide some substance of money to us. And the Welsh wouldn't be daft enough to try and break that union as it currently stands until we have more de devolution of lawmaking powers, etc., to look after ourselves. Okay. Uh, gentlemen here, would you agree that Wales isn't ready for independence? Yeah, no, I don't think it is. I mean, if you go back to something like the 1997 devolution referendum, the turnout was about 50.4%. And I agree about. that that was quite... Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, I'm a politics student. I think all the figures are ingrained. the statistician in the audience tonight. Um, but, I mean, as leader of Ply Cymru, do you think that there's been a lot of change since then? More people are actually now interested in further devolution and independence? Yeah. I do think more people are interested, and I also accept the point that you make. Most people in Wales would be nervous about us moving to independence quickly, and that's because our economic position is not the same as Scotland's economic position. But that doesn't mean we can't get to that point, and I think we should have the ambition and the plan to have a successful economy. And once we've got a successful economy, then our people can take the choice that people in Scotland took last week. And, you know, the principle that the people closest to a decision are the best people to make that decision is one I think probably we can all agree with. And the second principle in Wales, and the same goes uh, for Scotland too, they preside, we're both presided over by a government in Westminster that neither country has voted for. And the policies, the austerity, the cuts that have been meted out to us by the Conservative 
and Liberal Democrat coalition in London are not good for our people, particularly in our poorest communities in either Wales uh, or in Scotland. And so that's the debate they had in Scotland last week. And okay. I was in Scotland a couple of times and it was a fantastic debate. 85% of the people turned out and everybody, bar no one that I met anyway, was engaged in the process. And if we could have a debate like that in Wales, then the apathy that we've seen and the growing support for parties of the far right I think we would be able to stem and we would be able to generate an interest in politics uh, the like that I've never seen before in this country. Okay, uh, gentlemen yeah. up there. I'm a, very, I'm, a, I'm a very proud Welshman and um, things like that, but as a global community, we're supposed to be coming together. Why would you want to break away? Like, as. <laughs> as well? Oh. Last week, the debate in Scotland was being framed around Scotland given the opportunity to join the world community. It's not a case of breaking up or separating. It's voting, yes, to become a member of the world community as a nation state in its own right. That's such an important point. I mean I, I, I mean, I work in America sometimes, and I'm sick of people asking me where I'm from and saying Wales and then having to say, next to England. I don't want to have to say that. Yeah. Well, you still would have to, wouldn't you? That's you still would have to. What's that? You still would have to. I still would Wouldn't have make to. make any difference. Yeah. No, I think if it's we've got our seat at the UN, I think that'll help a little bit. I think I've, so. I've... It won't help with American's geography, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Angela. I, I'm, I'm totally with the gentleman over there. I think in, in this very, very disturbing age of fractured societies, from the, the end of the spectrum where we have dysfunctional family life right through to, to what's happening globally in the world at large. We are a union. The union is stronger than the sum of its parts. Do and you I feel was, like that about the European Union as well? I, that's a, I think the European Union is an entirely different conversation <laughs> too. No, and I think it's a really... I think it's, it's typical... I think it's typical politicking... It's a typical politicking to kick in Europe every so often when it just sort of suits the, 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 the range of the, the debate. Union. I'm talking about the United Kingdom. I'm talking about the United Kingdom. We have men... Men, I'm afraid, in this country fought together in the First and Second World War. We have to look at what each area of our communities definitely need, but I don't understand why the, why the need for borders and separation and devolution... I mean, they're talking about... I'm from Manchester, and, uh, you know, they're talking about devolving powers to Manchester. I think we have to have a fair, egalitarian and equal society. It, comes, it noses back to so our no original borders debate. except for Europe. But we are a united kingdom. We are a country. I don't but understand. There's borders between in Europe. There's borders. Yes, between. maybe there are borders in Europe. We are talking about. <laughs> no, you see, if you want to simplify it, if you want to simplify it, that's up to you. Because you you started off talking about the needs of the Welsh people. We're talking about the needs of the Scottish people. I think we are much much stronger as a union. And yes, Westminster has has to understand that there may be needs in in the broader communities of Wales and Scotland that are to dress from a London-centric. Okay, okay Angela, go back into the audience. Breaking now. up the, the union. Yes. Lady here, please. Um, I completely disagree about the independence. Um, I don't think we should go independent. Um, Scotland um, is a country that has natural resources such as oil, and therefore that would make them rich if they were to go independent. Whereas Wales doesn't have natural resources. We used as to have such. coal. Coal. You used to. But we never, made, we never kept the money from. What's it, to be we? achieved by um, being independent? Uh, so I don't think we could go independent because um, it would send us into debt. Okay. It would if we uh, did it lady at the back right. here. But long term, it doesn't. Uh, I'm English, and personally, I love Wales, and I'd be gutted if they left the union. Yeah. But I can completely. <laughs> I can completely understand um, where it's coming from because I think a lot of us here probably don't feel represented by the Westminster government and it's just not working. We're not getting our representation. We're being led by Westminster instead of being led by the entire union. Okay. So what I can see why yeah, you want to What are people saying on the power the online world and see what people think at home. Should Wales have the same powers as Scotland? 73%, so the overwhelming majority of our online audience are engaging at home, say hashtag free speech, yes. Um, and this is a question for, for you, Leanne. Is it really representative of the people in Wales, independence, when 17% of people didn't want to go for it? In a recent poll? No, and I think those polls ask people, do you want Wales to become independent now? Mm -hmm. And I understand the reticence behind that because of our economic position. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't aspire to have a more successful economy. And it doesn't mean that we shouldn't aspire to be an independent country because independence is normal. It's the state that most countries in the world are in. And we are the anomaly, actually.
Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, gentlemen here. Thank you. I would like to say I'm also English and I'm studying Wales and I love Wales. Um, what does the panel think of perhaps having a federalised uh, United Kingdom rather than be it being independent? Well, okay, yeah. that could work if the, the constituent parts were equal. But given that one part of the four or three and a half countries that would make up that federation is so huge, then there would be a big power imbalance. So that could be difficult. Do you think that if you want to have an independent Wales, that it would be fair for, for people of England to take part in some kind of referendum to ask whether you should stay or not? No, I think people in England should have a referendum and a debate about what they want for their uh, political arrangements. And if that results in an English parliament or regional uh, bodies within England, then that is a matter for people in England. But I think people in Wales should decide what happens in Wales, just as people in Scotland decided last week about the future of Scotland. What do you think, Laura? Well, I think um, it's interesting. I lean as well towards this idea that, that togetherness is you know, something beneficial, especially on a world stage. But I think that it's very easy to say that when you're English. And if that's what we want, and if that's something that we think is beneficial for all of us, if we think that we have strength in numbers, that it's better for us to be together, then I think that we have to make sure that countries like Wales and Scotland have the devolution of powers that they need to do what, you know, what's right for them. And actually, I was really shocked to discover earlier on that Wales has less of a devolution of those powers. I wasn't even aware of that. And I think that if we want the benefits that come from standing along alongside Scotland and Wales, then we have to also give them the powers that they need for it to be beneficial for them. Uh, yeah, lady here. <laughs> I just wanted to go back to, um, Angela, what you said about World War II and you were saying, um, talking about, like, men fighting together f um, during World War II. And I just wanted to use it as an example of, like, everyday sexism because you completely ignored the contribution that the women of, of this country, but also the other countries, who had to take over men's jobs and who had to come out of, for example, the house and childcare and all the things that they'd normally done up to that point. And to That's then... a spectacular example of what my problem is with feminism. I just made a very generalised point about men going out to battle together. I didn't in any way suggest that women hadn't made a very, very important contribution to the war effort. Okay. Also, let's stick right. talking to, uh, about so devolution, unhelpful. probably. Gentlemen here. Very unhelpful. I'm going to come back on to your point when you said about Wales being devolution. Uh, Scotland and England has a youth parliament. Why can't Wales have one? They've just recently got rid of the national voice for young people and between, under the age of 25 called Funky Dragon, Children and Young People Assembly for Wales. Why can't we have that in Wales? Why can't we be exactly like England and Wales? Uh, England and Scotland. Scotland sorry. My first idea, don't call it Funky Dragon. Leah? <laughs> No, I, I agree with the point. There does need to be a forum for, for young people, and there, it's absolutely unacceptable that uh, a system like that exists in England and Scotland, and it doesn't uh, exist in Wales any longer. Just should be brought back. Uh, unfortunately, that is all we've got time for. We will be back in a fortnight's time, Tuesday, the 7th of October, when we'll be in Dover. Remember, email us, freespeechaudience at mentorn.tv to apply. There and she is. please don't forget our Choose Our Audience questions. Yeah, we know, the acronym's unfortunate. No comment, Rick. It's been Cop. reset and is waiting for your questions. You click <laughs> like on those questions. You most want to see on the show. We'll count them up and see what comes top. But for now, I'll consider your speech freedom. We'll see you in two weeks' time. Good night.